Welcome to yet another extremely topical and extremely timely AMET webinar. This webinar is being brought to us through the very generous contribution of Donna Gary in loving memory of her husband, Stuart Hunter Gary. May his memory be as a blessing. As we're speaking, the entire international community is waiting with a certain degree of bittersweet hope and anxiety to see how the hostage release negotiated by the United States, Qatar, and Egypt will play out for both Israeli national security interests and American national security interests. Um, in case anyone perchance might've missed this groundbreaking news, tomorrow Hamas is due to release some 50 women and children in exchange for 150 Palestinian terrorists, some humanitarian aid and a period of calm. Since Hamas launched its brutal attacks against Israel on October 7th, Hezbollah has continued to escalate its attacks on Israel's northern border communities and has launched dozens of rocket attacks, mortar shells, and anti-tank missiles over Israel's northern border. On October 20th, Israel had to evacuate more than 60,000 residents from the northern communities. Meanwhile, Iranian-backed proxies have been attacking American bases in Iraq and in Syria, at this point about more than 60 times. The Iranian-backed groups um, seem to attack U.S. bases on an almost daily basis. On Monday night, several U.S. servicemen were injured in an Iranian-backed attack on the Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq and the U.S. did respond with force. It appears as though, despite all of the provocations of Hezbollah, the United States doesn't want Israel to respond in kind. Axios reported on Monday that senior Biden official Amos Hochstein arrived in Israel on Monday in order to persuade Israeli officials not to engage in a war with Hezbollah in Lebanon. About two weeks ago, Sheikh Nasrallah delivered a very lengthy but laconic speech in, in the Lebanese Southern Front. Is another front opening up from Southern Lebanon? Is a war with Hezbollah um, inevitable? And is Hezbollah going to honor the peace that was, or the period of calm rather, that was just negotiated with Hamas? Here to answer these questions and more is our wonderful friend, Sarit Sahadi. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sarit Sahadi is the founder and president of AMA, a nonprofit and an independent research and education center that specializes in Israel's security challenges on its northern border. Sarit has briefed us many times, and we're really, really honored to have her as a really dear and cherished friend. She's also briefed hundreds of groups and forums ranging from U.S. senators, congressmen and women, and politicians to senior journalists and visiting VIP groups in Israel and overseas. Sarit scripts numerous position papers and updates um, focusing on Lebanon, Syria, and Israel's national security challenges. She served for 15 years in the IDF, specializing in military intelligence. Sarit holds an MA in Middle Eastern Studies from Ben Gurion University, and her unique achievements have led her to be selected by the Jerusalem Post as one of the top 50 most influential global Jewish personalities in 2021. So Sarit, once again, it is an honor and a privilege to talk to you. Um, first of all, the first question on everyone's mind is how does this hostage release impact on the great greater global war between Iran and the West? Well, it's too soon to tell. I just want to um, make sure we all understand what uh, what is the deal itself, because it was uh, just published. Uh, there was a government decision now that says that uh, 50 Israelis will be released uh, within four days in four beats, what we call beats, uh, in each beat it is uh, 10 Israelis that will be released. In total, Israel will release uh, 150 Palestinian prisoners, which are actually terrorists. 
Uh, I saw the list. It is not a terrorist that succeeded in carry out terrorist attacks, but they are terrorists that tried to carry out terrorist attacks. Uh, there are terrorists that threw stones, stones can kill. There are terrorists that uh, were involved in terrorist activity, but not direct uh, attacks. Uh, so various kinds, but not the what we call murderers uh, that actually killed. Now, sometimes you don't kill because your weapon didn't work. Okay, that's that's what I'm talking about. So. To let these guys go, uh, it means actually to bring them back to terror. It's not about uh, just punishing them or revenge. It's about the fact that once they are going back to the zone, they are becoming our enemies again. Sinwar himself is one of the terrorists who was released in the previous deal with we, which we made to get one soldier's life for 1,000 terrorists. The Israelis that will be, the abducted Israeli that will be released are women and children mainly, but we don't know the names yet. It was not published. And there are some traveling questions around this uh, deal. I can uh, divide them to three topics. One is what's the end when when this ceasefire is going to end because even if i said four days it is written in the government resolution that it can be continued up to 10 days 10 days of a ceasefire in the middle of a military campaign is a long time it's a long time for hamas to prepare and it connects to the second uh, traveling sentence which i didn't read it in the deal but it is discussed uh, all over the israeli media that uh, we will enable the entrance of fuel to Gaza without uh, restrictions. If this is true, which I don't know whether this is true, but if this is true, this would mean that Hamas will have endless amount of fuel to fuel the rockets that are being launched to Israel. So what will happen after 10 days? Uh, the third problematic uh, question, which again, it's not specified in the re resolution, but it is discussed in details in the Israeli media, is the question of intelligence gathering. Will be ceasefire, what does that mean? Just attacks? What about gathering intelligence? Can we fly? Can we send uh, UAVs to gather intelligence? Can we send F-16 to gather intelligence? Can we see what Hamas is doing while we are seizing fire? And this is without even getting to the question whether Hamas will actually seize the fire, because in the past, it broke the ceasefires a few times. So these are the three questions that we that I'm, I'm talking to you now, and I'm, I'm happy for the release of women and children, and I'm, I'm worried about the campaign. So many soldiers were killed in this campaign. 60 soldiers were killed in this campaign, in the ground campaign in Gaza. And all of us Israelis want this campaign to succeed. Success means the elimination of Hamas. And if we will be stopped now, we will not get this very important achievement, which means that within a few years, our people in the South will be at the same risk. And it will be really difficult to build the communities that were destroyed, again, under the same threat. Okay, so now having said that, I think we can move forward to, to the Northern Arena. Straight or Sarah, you wanna squeeze a question okay. here? Or? Yeah, okay. Um, so do, how do you think Sheikh Nasrallah um, is interpreting this? Do you think, he is feeling empowered um, that, um, and what does this do to the future of hostage taking? So first let's start again with the data and then let's try to see the scenarios. Nasrara, uh, there is unofficial announcement of Hezbollah, unofficial, that they will be part of the ceasefire as if voluntarily. 
okay? We don't know that it was discussed uh, in the negotiations. That's one thing. Uh, I can say that if I'm looking at what happened on our border today, there is no difference between today and yesterday or the day before or the day before. In the past week or even two weeks, we had every day more than 10 attacks or around 10 attacks, the average, of Hezbollah and other factions on the Israeli-Lebanese border. Occasionally a little bit also from the Syrian border, but mainly Lebanese with rockets, missiles, anti-tanks, mortars, and UAVs, and even some tries of infiltration. Most of these attacks were carried out by Hezbollah. Some of them were carried out by Hamas. Doesn't matter. Most of the Hezbollah attacks were carried out by against military presence of the IDF on the border. Some of these attacks of Hezbollah were carried out against civilians as well. And at the same time, IDF is retaliating to all of that. And every day we hear attacks of the IDF in South Lebanon, in the towns next to the border. Yesterday, IDF published a video of attacking the launcher that launched anti-tanks to Israel. And this launcher was on the roof of a building, uh, of, a, of a house. Until now, Hezbollah has 80 uh, casualties. Israel has much less than that, civilians and soldiers. Um, 80 casualties that didn't fight. So uh, I'll put it this way, the, the, the balance of power here is as follows. On the one hand, this is an attrition war that uh, Hezbollah succeeded in establishing meaning it's been 45 days that we don't have normal life here, okay? My, my children are not going to school, and if they go, they go for a few hours every week, every week, few hours, not every day, only in the shelters. There is no routine. We hear the fightings. We hear the explosions. Um, as I've said, every day there are attacks. 60,000 people are evacuated, and that's why there is less casualties on the Israeli side. And nobody knows when these 60,000 people will be able to get back to their homes. Uh, Hezbollah is being attacked. We see evacuation, voluntarily evacuation of Lebanese from their homes. We don't know the exact number, but it's probably a few tens of thousands. I am still checking whether how, how much is is it also among the Shiite towns of South Lebanon or mainly Christians? We're still checking that. Um, and I don't see enough resistance to Hezbollah in Lebanon. Even if I see campaigns, even if I see, uh, uh, I'm not sure these campaigns are genuine and I don't see them coming from the base, what we call the base of Hezbollah in South Lebanon. Maybe it will happen in the near future, but for now, I don't see this happening. I believe, and here I don't have proofs, but I believe that among the military operatives in, of Hezbollah, there is a frustration because these are young guys that are very much motivated that Hezbollah built the narrative that it is about to attack Israel and we are prepared and we are about to do it and it was not done uh, I mean, it is it is happening every day, but not with an invasion. And the narrative that was built was a, was built a narrative of an invasion, like what we've seen in. So, and can you comment? Yeah, comment a little bit about UN Security Council Resolution seventeen oh one, the effectiveness of UNIFIL um, and the Lebanese Armed Forces. I know, you know, Ahmed has spent a lot of time discussing how much Hezbollah has overridden the Lebanese armed forces, but um, yet we, every year, give millions and millions of dollars to the Lebanese armed forces under the illusion that somehow they could contain Hezbollah. Um, can you discuss that a bit? Yes, of course. Uh, for now, both of these players, have zero effectiveness. 
The answer is clear and, and easy. With regard to preventing the attacks of Hezbollah against the state of Israel. For now, these attacks are happening from next to Unifil positions. Not all of them, but many of them. And Unifil, sometimes they were um, uh, not casualties, but wounded soldiers of Unifil as well uh, by the either mislaunched of uh, Hezbollah missiles or IDF retaliation. We don't know. But Unifil soldiers are at risk. That's the bottom line. And Hezbollah is using them as human shields as well, not only the Lebanese themselves. So this is to your question. And actually yesterday, uh, the state of Israel uh, appealed to the UN with a demand uh, to the implement, for the implementation of 1701 of the resolution saying that uh, if this the resolution will not be implemented, I don't know, something of the sort, uh, we, we didn't get the exact text, but uh, it's kind of a threat that this resolution must be implemented. Now, what does that mean? How it's going to be implemented if the UN reads the resolution different than the state of Israel, okay? The UN interpretation for the resolution is that it's not the mission of the US to, to implement the resolution. It's the mission of the Lebanese army to enforce the area from the blue line, from the border to the Litani River, 20 kilometers, should be empty of any military presence. 10,000 UN soldiers failed to do that in the past 17 years since this resolution actually ended the previous war. So why would they do it now? Under what circumstances Hezbollah will just agree to withdraw? You see the photos behind me, these were taken in the past year and a half of Hezbollah military operatives on the border, establishing military positions on the border next to UN positions, next to UN positions. Uh, it, just, it just doesn't happen. And I don't see this happening. I, I think this resolution is completely dead. And if we want to have an international solution, diplomatic solution, we must have a different mechanism. We cannot rely on the old one because we are gonna be fooled again. And there is no willingness by the UN to have any conflict with Hezbollah, any violent conflict with Hezbollah. And to enforce the resolution means violent conflict with Hezbollah because it's not Hezbollah is not going to volunteer to disarm from South Lebanon. Even if they will promise that and sign on that and commit to that, it will not happen. They would not do that. They will lie. And we cannot believe an organization that, as I've said, prepare the hearts and minds of its fighters to invade to Israel and kill Israelis and this is their state of mind now, and they are like standing there prepared to do so. So um, what do you think UNIFIL thinks its mission is? I mean, UNIFIL, it's, uh, is saying, UNIFIL is saying that clearly that their mission, they are a peacekeeping force, not peace enforcement force. This is what they are saying. And they are saying clearly, we are here to assist the Lebanese army and force the resolution. And we cannot enter to private territories while the rockets and munitions are in many cases in private territories. Why am I saying many cases? Because the positions that Hezbollah had built in the past uh, two years on the border were not on private territories and UNIFIL didn't get into this position and still waiting for the, for the Lebanese army to give it permission to enter to these positions even though it's not needed. It, and it's the same with shooting ranges that UNIFIL saw from helicopter patrol they waited for the permission of the Lebanese army to enter and they didn't. It's the same with the openings of tunnels, border crossing tunnels into Israel, that they didn't receive the permission of the Lebanese army to enter, so they didn't enter. And it's the same with openings of tunnels that UNIFIL itself identified from its helicopter patrols and didn't enter because they didn't receive the, even though this permission is not needed by the resolution itself, the resolution, it was supposed to promise the independency of UNIFIL with patrolling in South Lebanon. So again, you know, it's a matter of expectations. 
Uh, if you don't expect too much, you have nothing to complain. If you expect too much, maybe you have. I don't expect anything anymore from the UN. Right. Well, we know that the government of Lebanon is basically dominated by Hezbollah. Um, that calls the shot. So um, the Lebanese armed forces, therefore, um, is should very much be dominated by Hezbollah. To what degree do you see the Lebanese mm. armed forces having a relationship with Hezbollah? First, I will say that I saw this relationship in my own eyes, meaning that I, when I was at the border, I saw Hezbollah taking photos of me and, and Lebanese army forces stand next to him. I saw uh, Hezbollah using the towers of the Lebanese army, more than the Lebanese army using the towers of the Lebanese army, watching towers, okay? So uh, there is daily collaboration between the Lebanese army deployed in South Lebanon and Hezbollah. Second, I would say that uh, I don't understand why the West, uh, by any way, should uh, provide the Lebanese army with anti-tank missiles, which this happened a few months ago by France. I truly don't understand that. Why, wh whose tanks exactly is threatening Lebanon, except for Israeli tanks? And third, I would say that actually I understand, I understand why it's important for United States, France, and others to provide uh, assistance to the Lebanese army. Since the Lebanese army is the last uh, site of consensus in Lebanon that the Lebanese truly believe in, the last uh, player in the Lebanese system that the Lebanese truly follow. But actually below the surface, uh, we see growing a presence of uh, Shiites in the combat units of the Lebanese army. Of course, the, the Shiites are becoming um, not the majority, the, not, I don't know if they are the majority in Lebanon, but they are the biggest sect in Lebanon, that's for sure. And it reflects also with the, within the Lebanese army, especially in a situation that uh, there is no more uh, compulsory service in Lebanon. The, my bottom line is that I understand that it is need, that United States needs to support the Lebanese army because if United States will not support the Lebanese army, somebody else will maybe Iran, maybe Russia, maybe, I don't know, China, but I don't understand why anti-tank missiles are being provided. I don't understand why anybody expects the Lebanese army to become an alternative to Hezbollah. I think we should all, and this, again, it's like with Unifil, we should all lower our expectations, understand what we want to gain out of this assistance and not to have you know, uh, not to hope for things that will not happen. In a future scenario of high-scale war, in opposed to what we have now, which is a low-scale war, in, in all-out war, again, like what is happening in the Gazian border, I believe that the Lebanese army will participate against Israel because it has to prove that it is the defender of, Le of Lebanon, just like Hezbollah has to prove that. So I don't see that, and, and the Lebanese army in opposed to 2006, it is deployed in South Lebanon. So I don't see, it's difficult for me to see a scenario and I hope I'm wrong, but it's difficult for me to see a scenario that the Lebanese army will not become Israel's enemy in a all out war between Israel and, and Hezbollah. And I'm very sorry to say that again. Right, right. So there are uh, eventually, it's inevitable. Do you feel it's inevitable that there will be an all out war between us and right? Look, uh, you know, I have I had a discussion with a dear friend today <laughs> that we both know. And um, I told him that I, I am afraid that my professional assessment will be affected by my emotions. Uh, because eventually I'm an Israeli and I live in the north. I live nine kilometers from the border. And we are under threat. We are under attack. And um, to see what Hamas had done in October 7th is to see what was supposed to happen to us. What was the plan against us? How somebody planned to slaughter our children. And this is extremely difficult on the psychological level. So my first instinct is to say, I want this threat to be eliminated. 
I am no longer willing to sleep with this monster, this time named Hezbollah. In the South, it names Hamas, and elsewhere it named ISIS. Doesn't matter. They are all cruel the same way. And on the other hand, I understand the cost of war. <clears throat> I understand that if Israel will make its decision to go, for example, for a preemptive attack, we will have thousands of rockets that will be launched from Lebanon every day here because the uh, array, the, the missiles array and the drones array, UAVs array of Hezbollah in, is 10 times bigger than Hamas, 10 times bigger with the amount. And it's also the quality of the missiles is different. And of course, with this, we're also taking the chance that the involvement that you see now of uh, militias in Syria and Iraq against US forces and of Yemeni Houthis against Elat. Today, we had alerts in Elat and a missile was launched against Elat and it was intercepted. This involvement will become uh, greater if there will be war in Lebanon as well. Moreover, moreover, how much understanding we will get from the international community to attack Hezbollah missile sites in Beirut, for example, doesn't matter where, that are hidden inside the homes of the Lebanese. Look what is happening in Gaza and how it is difficult to explain that in the public sphere. I know that within the governments, we do get the support, but I also know the difficulties of the governments themselves when we speak of the public opinion. So all of that makes me feel that I don't know what to wish for and I don't, I don't have all the answers. I understand the pros and cons, but I think that to all Israelis here up north, it is clear that we are not going to continue to sleep with the monster. This way or another, this will have to be solved. And if the Israeli government will choose uh, the option of the diplomatic solution, my assessment is that Hezbollah will do everything it can to take its time, attrition war, to take its time to, uh, to negotiate forever. And meanwhile, as you said, 60,000 Israelis cannot go back to their homes and Hezbollah is not disarmed. And we will have to be very strong in putting a deadline to these negotiations. So the United States um, has sent um, to US aircraft carriers into the region and um, a naval nuclear submarine. Um, how much of a deterrent threat do you think that poses to Khomeini um, and to Sheikh Nasrallah and their calculations, or does it at all? You said that uh, US forces were attacked 60 times right. since October 7. What is deterrence? Is it deter Iran from uh, creating an all out campaign at the same day from all the fronts uh, that again, that has a deadline and a schedule and, you know, wow, uh, World War III? Maybe. Was that the Iranian plan? I'm not sure. Maybe the original Iranian plan was to create a war of attrition using Hamas as the opening maneuver. What do they care to sacrifice the Gazians? Hamas wanted that. I don't know. But the bottom line is that the Iranian strategy is, is different than our strategy. And the Iranian strategy is to exhaust us. Uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of Israelis are drafted. The economy is dysfunctioning. I already talked about international arena. People have no homes to go back to. Uh, we cannot enable that for years. We're not willing to enable that for years. What the Iranian wants is to, that it will take years. How do you do, what do you do in order for it to take years? You create a, a conversation of deterrence. Yeah, the Iranians are deterred. They're not deterred, they're just patient. That's the difference, they're just patient. If they were deterred, you should have seen zero attacks against US forces. 
if they were deterred, we should have seen zero Hezbollah attacks on the Israeli-Lebanese border, and my daughter could go to school safely. This is not the situation now here. So they are not deterred the way we want to put it, or you know, we ignore that there is actually war here up north. We ignore that, but there is. Um, and yet, I prefer the situation as it is now than without the US carriers or without submarine. <laughs> Uh, I am grateful for uh, this decision to send all this assistance and probably there is much more uh, by the United States. I feel that this is extremely encouraging and blessed and it gives us also a boost of uh, encouragement. And, but eventually let's not be mistaken, the meaning of this assistant is not with regard to deterrence, it, it is rega with regard to operational capabilities. It actually means that the US has the capability to get involved if needed. That's the true meaning of that. And that's why it's so important. Excellent. And now it's my supreme honor to turn um, the podium over to my wonderful colleague, Hussein Abubakar Mansour, who will read some of the questions that have come in and um, perhaps pose some of his own. Hussein? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you very much, uh, Sarid, for such a timely presentation. And thank you for all our audience who tuned in uh, to our webinar today. Please continue sending us your question through the Q&A functions and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, enough time to go through all of them. Uh, so we received multiple questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of reframe them um, myself and also referring to an earlier webinar that we had here in the Met uh, with uh, Mike Duran, um, in which uh, from the Hudson, uh, uh, in which he said that the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, capabilities have been deployed in the Middle East to support Israel. Um, is more of a bear hug than it is actually for deterrence. That is, uh, its aim is to restrain, uh, restrain Israeli action uh, against Hezbollah and against Iran um, than it is actually uh, uh, to try to uh, uh, deter these uh, forces. What is your comment on this? And, and is it true that there is uh, so much U.S. pressure on Israel uh, not to take further action against Hezbollah? I tend to agree. I think this is part of it. I understand this is part of it. I understand that uh, the US administration is trying to do everything it can to prevent further escalation. Uh, and I also understand that there is a difference between the Israeli interest and the US interest. That's almost natural, okay? But eventually, uh, between our leaders, a decision will have to be made. What do we do with the Northern Front? Uh, and I strongly invite, uh, if any anybody here listening to us from the, admin, the current administration, to come here and to, to spend the night at my house and to spend the day here and to try to travel. I don't know if the CIA will approve, but to try to travel <laughs> on the northern border here because it's extremely dangerous. Uh, the communities are based at the fence, at the border. People are leaving, the kindergarten is at the border. The school is at the border. The, 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 the chicken hooks are at the border. The factories, places where people go to work are at the border. So what do you do? You don't leave them anymore? What would you do? We, we empty these places? Israel is not that big. What do you do? And okay, that's zero to five kilometers. I live nine kilometers. Who is going to promise me that I can sleep at night when I hear drone, and I will not be afraid that this is a Hezbollah glade that is, uh, you know, uh, like a drone that comes above me uh, like he did in the music festival in Gaza. Who is going to promise me that? I can't, a different, I can't tell the difference with the sound. It's the same. And, and I can't sleep. And it's the same capabilities. It's the same offensive plan, Hamas and Hezbollah. Somebody will have to make sure that I am safe. So I understand, I can understand the position, but I think that eventually we'll have to move forward and to find a different way. Thank you. Well, related to this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say on this note, I'm gonna take all the questions that are related to this issue. 
um, uh, at the beginning of the war um, in Gaza, or immediately after October 7th, um, there were analysts and voices from the Israeli government that uh, suggested um, uh, to take out Hezbollah um, as well uh, right away and not wait for for um, uh, uh, not for uh, not wait for them to take the initiative. Um, are these voices still there? Uh, why were they uh, uh, not listened to? Is it American pressure or just the uh, the government or the uh, military leadership decided to go with a different strategy? I think it's a combination of both because uh, definitely IDF, I'm sorry, I was looking at the news because we got um, that there were more attacks coming from Lebanon and retaliation of the IDF. I just wanted to check. Uh, I believe that the IDF prefers a situation of one front war rather than two fronts war. Uh, well, however you look at that, it's more challenging, no, no matter what. Uh, I think that the Israeli policy is to prioritize Gaza, to make sure we eliminate Hamas in Gaza, and then find a way to work with the Americans and the rest of the world on solutions in the North, whatever they are, militarily or not. I know there was a debate in, in the government around what you just asked. I don't know whether this debate still exists. I think there is kind of a consensus among Israelis that we should finish the Southern Front as well. But at the same time, there are many voices here, especially from the communities in the, south, in the North, that are saying very clearly, we will not go back to our homes unless this uh, monster is killed, unless this monster is eliminated. Uh, this is not an option anymore. And I am among these voices, by the way. I, I think that I, I, am, I will not accept the existence of Hezbollah on the other side of the border anymore. So um, what is actually happening here is that we kind of uh, bought time, Israelis kind of bought time with regard to build the, the campaign in the North, while there is an attrition war and we face a lot of challenges, but it is what it is, okay? Again, the IDF prefers prefer it this way and I totally understand, but we have a little bit of time now to try to prepare. And part of these preparations is around international community. That's why I say to work with the Americans, to work with the Americans, uh, to make sure that the American administration understands that this must be solved and understand the risk and actually also public opinion, understand what we are facing, understand that it's the same monster. Can Thank I just you. interrupt there, mm -hmm. Sadrich? Um, not, um, Sheikh Nasrallah not, might not be reading our timetable. I mean, there might be an attack that's so devastating that Israel feels that it's inevitable that they have to respond now. Um, it may happen. And, right. It may happen. It, it, Nas, we, I'm not inside the head of Nasara. Right. Okay. I don't know whether he's going actually to be part of the ceasefire or not. I am. I. I, I believe maybe he will. But if he will, it, it's in order to make more preparations and make us also ceasefire then. Um, but what I can say is that, as I've said, you don't need to look only at Nasara because. I think that one of the reasons that we fail to understand what is happening in Gaza is because we ignore the tactic intelligence. And if you look at what, again, how Nasrallah built the anticipation among its own base and its own warriors that there is going to be an invasion, even for him, it is going to be extremely difficult to continue for 17 more years not to do an invasion. Okay, he made a lot of promises to his own warriors. How do you deal with that? And he continues to do that, the propaganda machine, which is aimed first and foremost to his own people because it's in Arabic, not in Hebrew, is continued to work. The incitement, the, the culture of death and the culture of hate continue to work. How do you solve that? And at the same time, the capabilities are there they are still in the border, even, the, even though they are being attacked by Israel as we speak, that's the update, which is that's good. It doesn't matter, they are still there. The, the Israeli attacks are not eliminating the threat. They are managing it. It's different. 
Um, I'll actually interject with a question of my own here, uh, since we mentioned uh, the Lebanese uh, uh, mafiesto, Hassan Nasrallah. In his speech, uh, Sarit, that was not too long ago, um, he seemed to me that he's trying to uh, manage the expectations of his uh, his audience, his warriors, that we support their resistance, but we, we uh, quote unquote, appreciate the independence of the Palestinian resistance. And it seemed to me that he was managing the expectations that basically he didn't seem to be too eager uh, at a full front war um, right now. Do you believe that's true? Um, and do you believe that this uh, uh, might change? What Nasrallah did is trying to disconnect himself or the campaign that he will ever, if he will ever and when he will ever carry a campaign, carry out a campaign against Israel, he tried to disconnect this campaign from the Palestinians. Uh, if he will carry out this kind of campaign, he needs the excuses for Lebanon. And that's why he's trying to drag us into war since day one. That's why you see all these attacks on the Northern Front, because eventually he knows that either Israel will get tired and we'll attack because we can know this is an unacceptable situation on the Northern Front, or something will happen, like the killing of civilians on one of these sites, okay, that will commit one of these sites to, uh, to further escalation. And then what? And that way he's building the legitimacy inside Lebanon, which for now it's really difficult for him, and yet, I don't see that it's really difficult for him among its own base. It is really difficult for him among those who already resist Hezbollah. I don't see the fractions yet inside its own base. And that's the biggest question here, whether there will be fractions inside the Shiite traditional base that support Hezbollah. We don't see that happening yet. I pray for it, but we don't see that, that uh, happening yet. I must tell you that though in, in his first speech, he detached himself from the Palestinian cause, in his second speech, he talked about the multi-front campaign that Israel is facing, okay? So he didn't say that he is going to go for war, but he did say he's going to escalate and he promised to use UAVs and Burkan missiles, which are half a ton heavy missiles, which he did this week. They destroyed an IDF base. Uh, Maybe I should say position. So, you know, Americans, Israeli base is much smaller than American base. But um, but for me to see that, the, even for me as an Israeli, to see the videos coming out of this base, which is a base that I know, what can I say? Burkan creates a lot of damage. This is a, an escalation. And this escalation is gradual since, since day one. We started from two attacks in the border, and we are now in an average of 10 attacks on the border. So if Nasrallah is deterred, why is he escalating the situation here? And I think the, 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 the answer is because it really wants to deteriorate into uh, something different, or he wants to create, a, as I've said, establish a war of attrition without being identified as the one who dragged Lebanon into war for Hamas, for the Palestinians, whatever. Thank you. Um... Uh, we want to ask about the uh, the 80,000 uh, elephant in the room. We, talk, we spoke about Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis, and uh, strikes against Americans in, in Syria and Iraq. So basically, what, what we're describing here is an uh, Iranian uh, regional war. Um, this is primarily a war between um, uh, Israel and the United States, even though the United States refused to recognize it as so, um, and uh, Iran. Uh, you you mentioned the Iranian strategy of basically slowly suffocating Israel on in, in these conflict. Um, how is Israel going to respond? Uh, uh, given the fact also that Iran still has its nuclear program, I mean it, their centrifuges are spinning as all of this is is happening still. Uh, uh, is uh, Israel planning or, uh, uh, any response uh, uh, to Iran or punishing Iran in any meaningful way for what's happening right now? I don't know what Israel is planning. I can't believe we plan to punish Iran, even though it may be a good idea, but I can't believe we plan that. I believe we do plan to, uh, we are making preparations, I'll put it this way, to cope with any nuclear threat that will come from Iran. And yes, the option that what is now happening was meant to conceal 
a progress in the nuclear project of Iran is not an unimaginable option. I don't have intelligence that can prove that, but uh, we can definitely say that this is an, uh, a legitimate scenario. Um, I just wanted to say, with regard to, as you said, the campaign with multi fronts, and only today, which is today, by the way, it's the independent day of Lebanon, which is not exactly an independent state. It's captured in the end of Hezbollah, you know. There were meetings between Nasrallah and the heads of Hamas. There were meetings between Hamas and Islamic Jihad. The Iranian Foreign Affairs Minister is in Beirut now. I don't know who is he meeting, but he's in Beirut now, in the Independent Day of Lebanon. Making a very clear statement, who's the boss here? Uh, it's very symbolic. And uh, we have seen a lot of coordination and meetings between these uh, four players, Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, and Iran, uh, in the month between, before this war and uh, in the weeks right after it started. So it is clear that they are all part of the same axis, axis of terror, if you like. And that's why this campaign is not between Israel and Hamas. This campaign is between the West and the terror players here, which are led by Iran. Um, I'll ask a very, a very quick follow-up question. Um, is it possible to defeat Iran without actually hitting Iran? The follow-up question on that is whether the Iranian people can defeat the Ayatollahs. That's the follow-up question, which I truly don't know the answer, but I know they have been trying in the past at least two decades and they failed. Iranians don't like the regime and the regime is still there. I think that if you truly want to understand how cool this ideology is, what I'm talking about, the monster, you don't need to ask Israelis, you need to ask Iranians. They, they understand better than me what we are handling here. Uh, so probably they need a little bit of help. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, if I could just interject. I mean, we have seen within the past two years, you know, this unbelievable turmoil within the streets of Iran and incredibly courageous people that literally took their life in their hands by resisting their oppressive regime. 20,000 have been arrested, 500 shot on the street, seven that we know of hung from the town square. Yet, yet we haven't seen real support from the United States. If there is ever a need for the United States to come to, to back um, a, a revolutionary a group, and we think that it's the majority within Iran, it, it has been now and at these past these past few years, you know, 2009, 2019, 2021, up until the present, and they're courageous people. So we really, I, I think one way of defeating the real monster that is empowering every terrorist regime and every destabilizing regime throughout the region and the world is to back the, the proud demonstrators on the streets. That's, sorry, but I just, we feel very passionately about that. We've spent yeah, a lot yeah, of time. I yeah. totally agree, Sarah, and, I, and I, we say even more than that, look what's the strategy of Iran. Look what's the strategy. Everybody uh, last week were quoting Reuters, that Khamenei said, Iran is not involved. And everybody like, but what did he actually say? What did he actually say? He wanted to det detach Tehran from what is happening in the Arab area, okay? This is what he was trying to do. But in the past decade, Iran built these militias everywhere in the Arab area in a way that they will be capable of maneuvering and uh, attacking Israel by themselves. Whenever they decide, look at the Yemenis. I don't know whether Iran gave a specific order to the Houthis to attack Israel or to attack the ship in the uh, Red Sea. Uh, at that time, at that hour, this ship. No, the Houthis have their capabilities. The Iranian build a kind of freelance that can do whatever they are interested in against Israel, against the United States, they have the capabilities 
It's kind of an octopus. It's not a chain of command in a way we expect it to be in the West. And that way, it's not Tehran. Yeah, Tehran is not involved, but actually Tehran is everywhere you look. <laughs> and I think that's, that's the, the illusion that we all live in. When the Iranians are saying, we are not going to get involved in the war. Yes, I'm not sure that missiles will be launched from Tehran, but they are launched everywhere in the Middle East from proxies of Iran in the Middle East. Thank you. Uh, we have we have a question about the 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 deal, the hostage deal. Uh, as a result of this uh, temporary uh, ceasefire, will Israel lose uh, the military initiative, allowing Hamas to reorganize itself, and basically ultimately repeating uh, 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 same cycles of uh, appeasements and and so on? This is a very good question. Question that worries us Israelis a lot. I am always asking how many soldiers will get killed. Uh, because of this deal, uh, it's a big question. And yet I think what we can all learn from this deal is how important it is for us as the Jewish state to bring back the hostages. This is a, a value, a noble value in our culture to bring back hostages. You don't leave anybody behind and our soldiers paid with their lives many, many times in the past to bring back hostages, to bring back the wounded, to bring to rescue the wounded, to rescue and even, even bring back the bodies of the soldiers. Uh, it's part of who we are. When we send our, our kids to the army, we know that if something will happen to them, they will be, their, their brothers will come, their brothers and sisters today will come and rescue them. We know that. And this is something we need to preserve. It's very important for us. So I agree, we are taking a huge risk in this uh, deal, but at the same time, this um, noble principle is equal to the principle of defending the state of Israel itself. And we can't ignore it. That's why the goals of the war were defined as one, eliminating Hamas and bring security to the south part of Israel, and two, to bring back the hostages at the same time. Thank you. Uh, it, someone is citing a report uh, in the Jerusalem Post that said that the number of the Palestinians who are going to be released in exchange of the hostages is actually closer to 300. Uh, with, and he's inquiring uh, which number is the true number. As far as I read, it's 150. Uh, maybe, again, I just read it before I came in because it was just published uh, during the day. Um, I know of 150, and maybe I'm wrong. I will check again. I saw the list. It didn't look like 300, but I will check again. Maybe potentially it can be up to 300 because the deal says that after the first phase of releasing 150 uh, terrorists by Israel and 50 Israelis by Hamas, there is a potential to continue uh, and Israel is willing to release more for more hostages. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, we have a question, I'm gonna uh, preface it by, by, a back, by the background of the increasing uh, terrorism in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank or the West Bank um, in the past few years that were directly uh, uh, tied to uh, uh, the rise of Hamas activities and other Iran-sponsored groups in the area of, of Jenin specifically. So the question here, um, is Judea and, and Samaria is a, a, a potential another prong uh, of aggression and another front uh, against, against Israel? It's already another front. While we're talking, IDF is very busy in West Bank. Only since the war started, IDF arrested more than 2,000 uh, terrorist, uh, members of terrorist organizations, uh, involved people involved in, in terror in various ways, more than 2,000. More than half of them are Hamas members. Uh, as we speak about uh, 200 Palestinians, again, terrorists in these fightings were killed uh, in the West Bank. I'm not hiding these numbers. These are the numbers. And uh, that's why there is already an active front. There is already an effort 
uh, in West Bank to create terror against Israel. And I want to say also that the reason that we didn't have elections in West Bank uh, it's not we Israelis, it's the, the Palestinian Authority that should have elections in West Bank. And we didn't have that since 2007. It's because uh, Mahmoud Abbas is afraid that Hamas will win. Uh, there is support for Hamas in West Bank, not because of Israel, because the Palestinian Authority is corrupted. And the uh, Palestinians are looking for an alternative. And when they look, that's the only alternative they could come up with them. I'm, I'm very sorry that this is the situation, but this is the situation. And now what Israel is doing is trying to make sure that after we eliminate Hamas in Gaza, we are not going to end up with a stronger Hamas in West Bank, mm -hmm. uh, which is even more dangerous because there are the, the settlers there. So that's why it was important to act at this front as well during the operation in Gaza. Thank you, Sarid. I want to apologize for all our listeners who uh, sent us questions and, and we simply don't have the time to go through them. And thank um, everyone for uh, for listening to us and just sending us the questions. I'm going to, in the last two minutes, I'm going to ask you uh, the last question, Sarid, and then I'll give it back to Sarah. Uh, uh, where do you think the U.S. foreign policy uh, or the U.S. policy in the region should be right now to allow Israel to win, uh, not just over Hamas or Hezbollah, but uh, over Iran? What do you believe uh, the United States should be doing uh, at the moment? The United States should uh, be willing, not even doing, doing it is already doing, but should be willing to use its power that was sent to the Middle East if needed. It's very clear. And the United States should enable us to finish the mission, to complete the mission, meaning to eliminate Hamas takes what it takes. And in the Northern Front, the United States should help us get rid of the monster, making sure there is a deadline for that. If it's a diplomatic route, make sure that uh, we are safe here on the Northern Front as well. Thank you, Sarit. I can't thank you enough for your years and years of wisdom, um, expertise, and valuable friendship. Um, I, I do have to put in a plug for um, Sarit and the Alma Center. Um, and um, uh, Sarit, um, what is the website that you use? Yeah, I'll type it donations? now in the, in the chat. Okay, yes. I would like everybody to please support the Alma Center that does invaluable work. Um, I also have to put in a plug for Amet. Every single day we're on Capitol Hill basically talking this talk about how um, there can only be peace through strength, that Israel is America's Eastern outpost in the Middle East, really holding down the fort um, for Western democratic values. And that um, we are all in this war against what they call the axis of resistance, what we consider the new axis of evil, with Iran, Russia, China, and Venezuela, and North Korea all together. And, um, you know, Israel has got to finish the job. And that's one of the things that we're talking about on Capitol Hill every day, that there should not be any impediment um, whatsoever for Israel to be able to complete its vital mission and that this is not a war that Israel asked to fight. This is an existential war and must fight. And they're fighting on behalf of not only Israel, but on behalf of the United States of America and Western democracies all over the globe. So we um, need your support as well. So if you could go to emetonline.org. We really vitally need your support. We not only have webinars every week with wonderful, valuable people like Sorit Zahavi, but we're on Capitol Hill every day and we write and publish every week um, trying to get the word out to everyone. And we also need that ev for everyone who possibly can make it to come to our dinner on December 5th. You can get all the um, information about that on our website at um, www.emetonline.org. And we want to thank Sarit dearly for her wonderful, wonderful work. And we will see all of you um, next 
Thursday, Thursday of next week. Thank you so much. Sarah, thank you very much and pray for the release of all hostages, not all just 50. Yes, thank you, Salit. Bye-bye. Yeah.